Well, good afternoon, um, everybody, and welcome to the Sustainable Entrepreneurship Session um, and this wonderful, wonderful festival, which I have thoroughly enjoyed sitting out there. Now you're going to have to endure me for a bit. I'm William Kendall, by the way. Um, some of you may have heard me a few um, hours ago wittering on about marketing on our farm, but I'm an organic farmer um, just over the border in Suffolk. Um, I'm an investor in early stage businesses and I previously sort of got to learn about early stage businesses by running New Covent Garden Soup Company, Green and Blacks, and more recently, um, Causton Press. Um, and on sustainable entrepreneurship, I, I frequently deny being an entrepreneur. And I've had this horrific moment in the green room with uh, these two wonderful entrepreneurs, as I thought, and they both deny being entrepreneurs as well. So if you want to... <laughs> If you want to uh, leave at this moment, but, but we're going to do our best. But I thought we would actually discuss a bit about entrepreneurship if we're, if we're allowed. But anyway, um, I have worked with some amazing entrepreneurs. And just on the sustainability bit, just to get a plug in, um, Green and Blacks was the first ever fair trade product uh, company in the UK. It sold the first ever fair trade. Anyway, as my wife would say, and she is in the audience, it's not about you. Uh, and as she does say frequently. <laughs> so we've, we've got over that bit. Um, Tom Barton, uh, Tom, and I, I've got a wonderful script, but uh, Tom is the man or one of the men behind uh, Honest Burgers, and if you haven't been to Honest Burgers, you're, you've, you're losing out. But he and his partners co-founded Honest Burgers fresh out of university in 2011 after selling burgers at festivals. They managed to open their first restaurant in Brixton on less than a shoestring of £7,500, which sounds improbable, but there we go. I, I heard him say it the other day, and I'm sure it's true through a combination of gumption, zeitgeist, and early rave reviews. Must be the zeitgeist. Their homemade burgers landed on the gastronomic map of London with a boom. Fast forward to now, and Honest Burgers now boasts 44 outlets all over the UK. True to its founding ethos of trying a bit harder than everybody else, Honest Burgers is now in the midst of reconfiguring its supply chain in order to make their burgers more, more sustainable. Josiah Meldrum, my neighbour in Suffolk, Josiah and the company he co-founded in East Anglia in 2012, Hodmedods, are at the forefront of making British farming more sustainable. Working with about 25 farmers around the UK to retail and wholesale beans and pulses to the hospitality and grocery industry, in addition to selling its own brand products online, Hodmedods benefits its network of farmers in two crucial ways. As an agronomist assisting farmers to produce new crops to British soils, and as a successful brand vouchsafing the traceability of its products. The latter allows Hobmedod's products to command a premium price in the consumer marketplace. So, Josiah, um, you know, you were, you were working in the third sector and you decided to go into business. I mean, what was wrong with the third sector? Tell, tell us a bit about what got you going on all of this? Yeah, so we'd, we'd um, the, myself and two founders of Hodma Dodd had been working for a small regional NGO called East Anglia Food Link. And we'd been, we'd been working for about a decade looking at food systems change, you know, everything from public procurement, food into schools and hospitals, through to community groups engaging with the production of their food. And um, we got really frustrated when we were engaging with local authorities and with MAF and then DEFRA around policy change in this space. And as an NGO, we didn't carry very much weight with the farmers we were talking to either. So we would go to a farm and say, you need to do X, Y, and Z, and that will, that will make your farm more resilient and more sustainable. And they would say, yeah, we know we need to do that, but who's going to buy it? Where's the policy that's going to support this process of change? And in 2012, really, we realized that actually the best way to affect that change would be to set up that route to market to demonstrate what change could look like to farmers and to consumers. And so we're, we've, we established Hobbinod as a small business to encourage the production of more protein crops in the UK. And we'd done a bit of research as the NGO, which had demonstrated that we need to eat less but better meat, and consequently more plant-based proteins, and that the UK is actually very well placed to grow those, but we feed them to animals, and we don't have a tradition of eating them, and we're very low per capita pulse consumers in the UK. And so really, the business was all about advocacy and telling that story. And certainly when we would then go to farmers, Instead of being a third sector organisation with some good ideas, we were offering them an opportunity to actually engage with the supply chain. And that's what allowed us to begin to create that change. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I like to think, when, when I come under attack from my friends who are doing worthier things than me, 
uh, and they say, you know, you're just a business, business person. I, you know, I, I, have, I have this sort of dream that business actually is rather an effective method of, of affecting change. And, you know, you can go into politics and you can go into charity and it's all mm. very good. But actually business can be very, very effective. And it sounds like you've done that. But Tom, you know, you, uh, we're going to talk about regenerative farming and, and what you've done. But you, would, you were making burgers at, at festivals. I mean, did you, were you trying to deliver societal change or were you just trying to make a buck? I was fresh out of university, so absolutely not. <laughs> no, I was kind of just trying to find something to do. Um, when, when I set up Honest um, with, with a, my mate who also was down in Brighton. So, yeah, for me, my now wife gave me a little bit of a kick up the arse saying, you know, I need you to, need to have a bit of drive and a bit of a career path. So, no, absolutely no aspirations to, to grow a business into what it's become. Um, we, we kind of stumbled into that after we opened our first site. So what happened? I mean, you know, but you are... An, 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 you know, what, there's, there's been a big change. I mean, I, I, I read something or, or saw you... Um, online talking about your first big break with the restaurant in, in Brixton. Yeah. But what, you know, at some point did you think, actually, this is way bigger than, than and, you know, I'm not, this is not just about having a kick up the arse. This, is, this, is, this, this could be big. Well, I think, yeah, that we, we, we realised we had an opportunity, but I, I went into the, into the, into Honest with the fact that I just love food and I didn't realise quite how much until I went to uni and I realised actually... I need to learn how to make nice food if I'm going to eat nice food. Um, and I had this kind of epiphany. Um, and that was where my kind of love for food really kind of started um, to bloom. And Honest was, was my way of kind of scratching that itch. Um, and it, has, it did kind of spiral. We started to just, you know, we had, we had very little money. Me and my film, my business partner, we had five grand between us to actually set the business up. So we, we had to go after the festival burger and... Even that, we kind of floundered because you need quite a lot of money to get into these big festivals. So we were struggling um, until we had our sort of big break where we went to Brixton Village. Has anyone been to Brixton Village in the audience? A couple? Oh, quite a few, actually. So you, you, might, you probably have the same um, feeling I did when I first walked into it about 12 years ago, where it's just this you know, kind of electric uh, melting pot of cultures and, and loads of really small little restaurants were doing... Um, amazing things and really focused menus because they're so small. Like our restaurant's 20 square meters. Um, and that was when we opened the doors there. We just, we called ourselves honest. We used good meat from good suppliers. We did very little kind of chef-y tricks to the food. Um, and we had a clear brand that people could engage with. And we had queues out the door from the moment we opened. We had, we, you know, that age old saying, especially in London, if people can't get something, and for us, you know, we regularly tell people there's a three-hour wait for a table, and they just go, okay, and, you know, stick a name on the list. And you're kind of telling them, kind of almost a bit embarrassed by it, but that was it for us. And we realised that what we're doing really does mean something to people, and, and what we were trying to do in the burger market was going down very well, and we had this opportunity, so we seized it. But what was... I mean, I'm, I'm obviously I'm going to thrash this thesis that we're all trying to solve societal problems... What was wrong with the burger market before you came along? And, and let's not go into... We're going to do regenerative agriculture, because, you know, there's a theme of regenerative agriculture. So we're going... And I've been to most of the sessions, and no one's, in the ones I've been, has defined regenerative agriculture. So we're going to have a go at that at some point. But anyway, what, what was wrong with burgers? For me, it's the same as what's wrong with most restaurants, is you don't know... You know very little about the menu. You know, most people go to a restaurant to eat the food. That is the... the the main catalyst for getting into that restaurant and giving someone money for something. Yet, you know so little about where that food comes from. And, you know, you could be spending 70 quid on a really premium steak in, in London and you still know the absolute bare minimum of where it comes from. And even from back then, honest, you know, we have this amazing word above our door which keeps us in check. And it kind of, for us, it dictated what kind of restaurant we were going to be which is a brilliant thing. You know, I urge anyone sort of out to start their own business to have a word that really does ground you and ties you into something because it was brilliant for us. So from the get-go, we were like, great, we're called Honest. That means we need to have free-range chicken. That need, means we need to have really great grass-fed beef. That's what I thought was great at the time. Obviously, no, there's much more to it to beef uh, now, but we were buying from the ginger pig butchers, um, which, again, at the time, I thought they were really great and they are a very good butchery brand, but... Um, 
you know, I didn't know enough about their supply chain, but it was all just about homemade food, um, well sourced and sourcing that we'd be proud to tell our customers about. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that, was, that was it. It was very simple. Like, you know, we would sort of joke about what the word entrepreneurialism means um, back in the green room. I wouldn't have classed us as entrepreneurs back then. We just wanted to do something that we were super proud of. And I wanted to cook food that I would eat. Mm. Um, and we always used to have a sort of saying where, would you serve that to your mother? Mm. And that was this kind of innate pride in us. Like we wanted, you want to please people when you, when you own a restaurant. You want people to come in and eat something and enjoy it. That was our goal. And, you know, other restaurant concepts, they don't have that feeling or they don't yeah. have that desire. They just want to get your data or get your email address or, you know, just convert you to eating three times a week with them. For us, it was very simple, good food, good service, repeat customer. It's really interesting. The mother, we used to say at Covent Garden Soup, would you serve this to your friends for supper tonight? And when we started, you know, going to the supermarkets, they said, well, that's a terrible, how, you know, how do you know your friends are? Well, we know who our friends are. And, and you know, so sometimes the... <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the emulsifier wouldn't work on the on the vessel, and so the carrot and coriander was chunky carrot and coriander. And they said, well, and we said, oh, we sell that because it's still perfectly good. That's what happens in the kitchen. Yeah. Sainsbury's were appalled by that. You know, the how, you know, we're not going to list you if you might mm. put chunky when it says it's it's smooth. Yeah, I know it's it's a lot wrong, isn't it? It's a lot <laughs> wrong. It, yeah. So Hobbit Dodds, I, I remember. I mean, obviously, I've known Hobbit Dodds since nearly the beginning because we live down the road and and we farm and, and work with you. Or we have done subsequently, which is, which is fabulous for us. Um, I'm, I've got a marketing colleague who you, you know, Tom, who Mark Palmer, he's kind of the consummate marketeer. And I remember him going to a trade show and he said, I've been around the whole thing. There were, he said, there were about 2,000 stands there, most of them new products, and there's only one interesting one, it's Hodmidods. And I said, well, I know them, which I, usually he told me stuff I didn't know. But I mean, it, it's... I mean, you're kind of taking on so many challenges. I mean, I'm not saying you're not, but, you know, there's quite a lot of burger joints out there and you decided to make them better and, and you've done a really good job. But, you know, you're taking on... I'm mean, going to talk about sort of supply chain and all of that, but I mean, this is pretty ambitious, what you were, what you were trying to do. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and then how do you communicate... I mean, how do you communicate what you're trying to do? I mean, I <clears> get it, but... Yeah, I mean, those things are all challenging. And I think m much, as you've already described, we didn't really know what we were doing when we started. Uh, we didn't, the best we, businesses don't. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and because we had no experience with what it was that we were proposing to do, we didn't realise what the complexities were. And I think if we'd have known, and, I'm, and a lot of startup businesses and older businesses say the same thing, if we'd have known at the beginning that this is what it's going to be like, we probably wouldn't have started. Because, but as it was, we did start and we overcame those challenges. And those challenges were really the process of decommodifying a lot of the... A lot of the crops that are being grown in the UK, you know, they're grown in large volumes, they're completely anonymous, we don't know when we eat a loaf of bread, we might know who the baker was if we're lucky, but we are very unlikely to know who the farmer was that grew the wheat that was in that bread. And without that connection, it's very difficult to affect change because we're always at one step removed from where our food has come from. And there's no accountability in, in every direction. And we, we've, we've had to try and break out of a system that is used to large volumes, um, you know, the, the metric, the, the unit of movement for a cereal is a, is a full load. It's about 28 tonnes. And if you're looking at less than that, everything becomes very complicated and very expensive. And when we started, we were definitely less than that. And for a lot of the very niche crops we're working with, we're still a lot less than that. Um, John Pawsey, who was, who was speaking earlier, you know, grows lentils for us. And last year was his first lentil year with us, and he grew five tonnes. That's an absolute supply chain nightmare to handle because no one wants to handle it within the commodity chain. They don't want to move it, they don't want to clean it. Um, and the whole thing, you know, involves an awful lot more effort. But at the end of it, we have something that tells a really immediate story about change on John's farm and, and how we've supported that change and how our customers can engage with that change process. So, so where we have a very small quantity of something like that with that very, very clear provenance, we'll put it on our website and it will sell in half an hour and, and we'll sell out. And again, for the supermarket, that's appalling. You mean you have got, not got continuity of supply on John Pawsey's special organic lentils? No. <laughs> when they're gone, they're gone and our customers love that. I mean, it's, it's arguably great if we have more of them, but it's also not a problem that we don't. Um, and I think as our business has developed, we've, we've begun to think a lot about what supply chains are. And I think one of the challenges of a supply chain is that 
in our minds and in picture books and in you know, the way that we learn about how the food system works, it's very, very linear. We think of the farmer at one end and then a number of different processing stages, gatekeepers, whether that's a, whether that's a contractor that's working on the farm, whether that's a processor that's cleaning and milling, the baker, the retailer, and then the final customer. And there's not really a flow of information in that, or if there is, it's, it's managed by one of those gatekeepers, usually the retailer, and often they want to obfuscate. They want to, they want to make sure that you don't know where that steak has come from because that might raise some difficult questions. And what we've sort of developed is a, is a completely different model and way of thinking about engaging with the, with the supply system, and that's to think of it as a network with nodes, and that we are one of those nodes, but there should be tr complete transparency between all of the other actors in the supply system. So whether that's a a customer, and of course we're all customers, um, whether that's a researcher working for an academic institution that's helping us with agronomy and seed work, whether that's um, a retailer or caterer that's using our ingredients, we want them to know where the farm is, we want them to be able to go and visit that farm and see that crop growing so they can engage with that process. Uh, whether it's a food writer or a journalist, or whether it's the policy uh, frame that we might be engaging in, in an advocacy sense. And the thing that we've realised is that, you know, we're not politicians either, but we've realised that Food is politics with a very, very small p, because we're all engaged in eating. It brings us together. It allows us to have conversations about how we're living in our communities and what we want those communities to look like and how the environment should look and how the landscape should look and how our health and well-being should, should look. So by engaging in those conversations through food, we can begin a very political conversation about social change. And all we do is sell beans and peas. You know? And I think, I think that's really, really exciting. And that is, you're absolutely right. Business is that lever for social change, even, even unintended. You only need to make often very small changes to your business in order to affect huge changes in people's lives and potentially policy. But there's, there's a lot of reinvention going on here, which is, is, is really hard work. And, and you are trying to run a profitable business. I mean, I'm trying to work out, you know, what, you know are you in any supermarkets? Uh, not at the moment, no. Are you, so, okay, so you answered my question. Do you want to be? Uh, it's a very good question. <laughs> uh, so they would like us to be. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the question for us is whether our relational supply network can deal with that. We've got, you know, we've built our business on direct sales and on sales into independent retail. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know that, you know, Pucker Tees and Green and Blacks, I think, probably all went through this this stage of questioning where your, where your brand needs to be placed and whether, if you're in a supermarket, you can communicate the same story. It's a, it's a, it's a point we're at. Yeah. I mean, it was interesting with Green and Blacks because we, I mean, I sort of inherited Green and Blacks when it was in its infancy and, you know, all of the health food supporters of it were very cross with us, but actually we saw our sales in our traditional outlets all rise much faster than the sales in the supermarkets rose because... Obviously, there was much greater awareness of the brand once it got into the supermarkets, and also they tended to stop the full range. So somebody might have found it for the first time in Tesco or Sainsbury, or Waitrose more likely, but they'd only seen a couple of flavours, and then they go to Focus Organic in, in Halesworth, and they discover that we had you know, 12 different flavours, and you know, it's cornucopia, and they load up with all of them, and Focus, mm. and everyone's a winner. So, you know, anyway, that's it. I, I want to I mean, I, I talk about your move into regenerative um, and, and um, we also want to work out what regenerative farming does mean but I also want to talk a little bit about this, this, this entrepreneurship thing because I think it's really important I mean what, what is you know I, I mean I've been accused or named an entrepreneur most of my adult life and I, I really don't feel like I, I went to business school now the first definition of a non-entrepreneur is somebody who went to business school because you know they can last a year or two, you can, you can spend two years, I mean, entrepreneurs, I thought, are impatient. But you just said, in the outside, you just said entrepreneurs are people on, on The Apprentice. Yeah, you, you said that, and oh, I think you, you nailed that. it. Well, yeah, I think, disagree. sadly, that's what entrepreneurship has kind of evolved into. It's this kind of, like, aggressive, success at all costs, kind of backstabbing, kind of... Well, maybe that is very much just The Apprentice. But I think, for, for me, no, it was, you know, I, don't, I, I find it hard to define that term and I always feel a bit uncomfortable if I get referred to as an entrepreneur I, de I definitely never felt that when we set up Honest I never in a million years thought I was being entrepreneurial I was just doing something that felt right for me at the time um, but yeah there was no well, I never in a million years thought we'd have 44 restaurants at this stage I just wanted to do something that I enjoyed and for me that's 
based around food. Um, and, and that was it. And now, fortunately, the business has grown. And because we did show lots of entrepreneurial um, sort of traits as we grew, and we're, 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 we're never comfortable on this. We're always in this kind of, I always think it's a really good space to be where you're kind of always second guessing nearly every decision you've ever made. And, um, you know, we always say you're only as good as your last burger. And for us, that has driven the business to become what it is today. I think, you know, you look at, you know, Byron's up for its third sale in five years, that, you know, that you see these meteoric rises of food businesses and, and equally swift um, demises. We've always continued to strive to grow and, and become a business that lives up to its name, which mm -hmm. is brilliant. I love having that word as this kind of burden on us all the time. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if I am an entrepreneur. I, and you're not either. I know that's probably not the right thing to say at this. It's, kind of yeah, thing, but. we're in the wrong session. Um, <laughs> yeah. They're still here. They're still yeah. here. But yeah, you're, I, I, you're not. I mean, I, I don't think of myself as an entrepreneur. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not entirely sure I even know what an entrepreneur is. Um, I'm a founder, obviously, and, and we're, we're purpose driven and we've, we've created this business. But um, in a way, I think, I think what you're doing is. I don't, and I think what we're both doing is, is, is something slightly different to the entrepreneurial model, where I think what we're doing is questioning what we do all of the time, not just yeah. the, you know, the financial decisions we're making or, or some relationship decisions with other businesses that we're making, but we're questioning the absolute fundamentals of what we're doing. And I, I, I feel like entrepreneurs often aren't doing that because they've always just got their eye on a particular exit strategy, and, and really whatever gets them to that point, that is the purpose. But it's, it's, you know, it's problematic. I mean, in one sense, you say, well, why are they talking about all this? But it's, you know, The Apprentice has apparently done amazing things for getting younger people to start up and do stuff. And, and God, we need that in, in, in the UK economy. Mm. So you know, if The Apprentice is doing a great job encouraging people to, to, to set up businesses which might possibly solve societal yeah. problems. I mean, if you're setting up a business now that isn't solving a societal problem, you're probably not going to have any customers. So, yeah. so that's a... You know, that has to be a good thing, and yet they're being taught that the best way of operating is to stab each other in the back. And, you know, and, the, and the catchphrase is, you're fired, which, by the way, I, to me, is the sort of biggest sign of failure in any business. <laughs> do you ever have to say that? So, you know, that, how, do we, how do we articulate this better? I mean, I, I think that we're all entrepreneurs, and I think the reason why people set up businesses is that they don't see a future for themselves in the environment that they're in. I mean, you were straight out of university, I'd been working in an investment bank, and it was a perfectly nice investment bank, but I wasn't allowed anywhere th near the decision-making process because I was a 27-year-old incompetent. <laughs> and so I had to go somewhere where I was allowed to be involved in the decision-making process. And I think we all want to be involved one way or another in the decision-making process. A lot of us are conditioned not to consider doing that at work. And so we do it at home. We do crazy things like move house and we take you know huge capital decisions we we book holidays we do you know we change well we used to change energy supply now you can't do it but you know those sorts of things um that that's entrepreneurial i think mm. i've definitely found because I, I speak to a lot of very young businesses like i've i've had chats with 18 19 year olds who are looking to go into the food space now which is amazing that it's so accessible for people to you know the rise of street food and things like that you can set up your own business for less than 10 grand, it's, it's brilliant. Um, and the, the theme that I always get from these young sort of aspiring business people is they just expect, and it, maybe it's this kind of halo around the word entrepreneur, they expect everyone has all the answers like they were just born with them and like th there aren't multiple circumstances when we set up Honest where we had absolutely no idea what we were doing yeah and you're and you know you you, you forecast what a restaurant's going to do and you're literally just like that mm. and and i think a lot of the people i speak to they they almost talk themselves out of doing something because they don't think they have the right skills because they think you you need these kind of almost ethereal skills you know like skills that you, you won't you you you're, like i said you're this innate ability to just have them and you mm. don't you just have to just crack on um and get on with it. And I think maybe that's, maybe that's the entrepreneurial kind of switch where you do just get on with something. Mm. Um, you don't talk yourself out of it. You're, maybe that's because you're more risk averse or less risk averse, I don't know. But I, co I constantly see people who seem to just not be prepared to make that proper sort of final stage. 
um, into setting something up because they're just wary they don't have the right skill set. Have any of your rest? You've got 40 restaurants. Now. Have any of them failed? I mean, have you have you closed? No, them? not no. yet. Touch wood. But well, I mean, you know, yeah, it's, they pretty, do now, it's, it's a pretty everything. shit year for restaurants. Yeah. Right? So um, I'm not sure if I'll be saying that at the end of this year. But no, so far we haven't closed. Actually, no, that's a lie. We did close a dark kitchen in Croydon, but that was it. That's but a lot of people say, and I certainly say this. I've learnt more from my failures. So when these young yeah. people talk to you, do they are you know, I mean, that, that would be the question I'd say. Well, tell, well, tell, us, tell us about your failures. I mean, you haven't, you haven't no. got a failure. You've got a hugely successful business. I've got business, millions but. of personal failures. But, not the, of, but I think... You don't need to hear about those. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but I, know, I think you should, because I think okay, your well. personal development is, you know, if, if, if your personal experience and development isn't going well, likely your businesses are going to suffer, right? And for, for us as a business, you know, I was sort of thrown into honest at a very young age to try and act like a mature business owner when you're 25 or 26 is, you know, nigh on impossible. So I had a bit of growing up to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. Like, we, we say it honest, it's only a mistake if you make it twice. Um, and I love our mistakes. I love, I love it when our people own their mistakes. And I cannot stand it when people try and cover up their mistakes. I think that's probably one of my least liked traits in someone where they just try and sweep something under the carpet. Um, so we embrace them. But, um, but yeah, I think a business, businesses are founded on mistakes, I'd probably say, yeah. <laughs> learning from them. I mean, what about you? I mean, you know fundamentally you're still going, so... Well, yeah, we're still going. But, I mean, you know, we've had crops that failed and relationships that haven't gone as well as they should do, you know, despite all the talk of a relational supply chain. Sometimes things go wrong. Um, and I think, I think sort of thinking about well, you can't take credit. You can't. You know, if you, the crop fails, you're not going to beat yourself up about that. No, we are if you've told the farmer to grow it, and it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's difficult. You know, and those things can be difficult negotiations to go through. And I, I'm thinking, as you were both talking about what entrepreneurialism, I wonder if part of it is an openness and a willingness to try something. Um, you know, when we when we started, we were told that there was no market for dried pulses in the UK, and that. We were, we were daft to be pursuing a business that was selling a very low added value uh, product and that people weren't really interested in plant-based diets. And I think there's a, you know, obviously there's been an incredible change and interest there. And that people weren't interested in farming, which is amazing. And here we are, you know, amongst a, a, a two-day festival where there's been an awful lot of talk about farming and farming change. Um, but, um, yeah, so I think it's that, that openness. But also, and I think this is the thing that, that possibly is often missing from those shows like The Apprentice, is that the thing that breed success is really asking questions but then working out who's got the answers and going and finding them and talking to them and collaborating with them and very open to their ideas and you know we have people smaller businesses that, that similarly phone up and talk to us and, and we tell them immediately what things that they really shouldn't do <laughs> because we've done them and they shouldn't repeat them um, so much more interesting the failures yeah I mean that's the book that's the that's the entrepreneur's book that no one ever writes but I mean God, not another success story. I mean, who wants to read? Well, <laughs> yeah. everyone seems to read, want to read them. But, I mean, God, my, my failure book is, I mean, it's just getting longer and longer. But, <laughs> but um, well, yeah, well, anyway, very interesting. That, I, at business school, learning not to be an entrepreneur, my favourite professor was a New York shrink, and he wrote a brilliant article called The Darker Side of Entrepreneurship. And it's, I mean, I didn't read all the stuff I was told to read, but I read that one, I still have it. Of course, it's all about, we're all trying to prove things to our mothers. And that's what, that's what entrepreneurship apparently is all about. It, you know, it tends to be, and, and you know, I think there is a darker side. You know, we are, we are sort of driven by something more than making money. It's big, I think it's a lot of ego, isn't there? Yeah. I think, I know, we're talking about The Apprentice way too much here, but there's far too much ego on that show, yeah. isn't there? Yeah. Where people yeah. are just constantly trying to maybe prove to their mothers what their success yeah. they are. But. Yeah. So, you, I mean, you started a business to make a better burger, but then more recently you decided that, and you, you were referring to it, you know, you thought grass-fed was good enough. And then you, what happened? You heard about regenerative agriculture. What, 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 what sort of... Yeah, I, um, I started to feel quite guilty, actually, to own a relatively big business. Like, we're still kind of tiny compared to a lot of other burger brands, but relatively guilty when I started to watch some of these things on Netflix and, you know, Cowspiracy and What the Health and Game Changers. And I was watching all these things. And I was like, God, if these are true, which, you know, I largely think they're not a lot of the time. But um, I, I, you know, how can a business be called honest? 
when we've got all these things that are gaining a huge amount of momentum. And I kind of started researching it myself. Um, and again, that word kept me in check. And I was like, if we're going to be called on this, we need to address sustainability. How on earth can we address sustainability when we don't have some solution for our beef? Like, it doesn't matter talking about paper straws and you know, biodegradable packaging if you don't have something to talk about when it comes to your beef and your, your supply chain. So I kind of went on this sort of one-man band mission to try to work out are there any other options um, and found it really interesting just trying to soak up as much info from anyone that would have me, basically. And I ended up at a um, National Farmers Union conference that they put on for Oxford and Cambridge students. Do you remember when... I think Cambridge is the first university they took beef off their menu mm. because their students were protesting because it wasn't sustainable enough. And there was, you know, national news. And um, the NFU then invited a load of those students to come to their head office and have a debate with some real leading scientists and um, uh, agrologists and, and, you know, really super intelligent brains. Um, and they had this really good debate and it was fascinating. And I just kind of sat at the back, kind of, you know, just listening in. But there was a chap who came on at the very end and, you know, he, he was following some pretty serious um, people in the space and he, he sort of steps up in his tweed suit and is a farmer from Shropshire and starts talking about regenerative agriculture and I'd never heard of it um, and they hadn't actually spoken about it at all before, um, before he started talking about it at that event. And he started showing me all these photos of cattle roaming in fields where, you know, they've got pasture kind of up to the and almost over the cattle's head, like it was, you know, crazy sort of scenes that I'd never seen such a wild, natural-looking process in farming. Um, and I just loved everything he was doing, and I, I sort of collared him at the end of the, um, the session and went to his farm a couple of weeks later, and that was it, really. I, I knew that if Honest was going to try and live up to its, its name um, and meaningfully and authentically tackle sustainability, this is something we want to get on board with. Um, but just to go back a bit, you mentioned the grass-fed thing. That was another on my kind of revelation in our business. I realised that there's so many terms in food and in customer terms that they might hear and terms that you know, only wholesale businesses might hear that just mean absolutely nothing. Mm. Um, and grass-fed's a great one. You, know, you, you hear grass-fed, you think, amazing. So that cow must spend its entire life outside eating grass, doing what it has evolved to do. Um, and it doesn't, you know, DEFRA has no sort of um, meaning for it, no, no status for it, that no one's actioning it. I found out that our supply chain, grass-fed, meant 51% of the cow's life should be fed grass. The other 49% could be whatever. And it was just kind of unpicking these things, and I was like, this is all just built on a kind of house of lies, really. Um, and, you know, I think you mentioned a minute ago about People don't, almost don't want to know this kind of ignorance is bliss is what our food supply chain is built on because most restaurants don't want you to know where their food comes from. They don't want you to see where their chicken comes from and, you know, things like that. So we wanted to do the absolute opposite and open the doors to everything and show our customers exactly what we do. Um, and that was it, really. That was, that was sort of... That was just before the pandemic hit. So I was getting a lot of momentum and it was going mm. really nicely. And then pa pandemic came along and knocked everything for six. So delayed it a little bit. And, but now we are where we are. And we're so, what, so where are you now? I mean, so, so Josiah was telling us about, you know, suboptimal lots. John pauses lentils in five tons when lorries are 25 tons. So, you know, you've got 40 restaurants. There aren't many regenerative farmers yet. Yeah. How the hell do you switch from your nice, convenient industry you know, yeah. practiced supply chain to... So it's, it's a little bit easier for us because we've got our own butchery, so we make our own burger from scratch. So we've, we were always buying beef direct from an abattoir. So we had a, we had a better, um, a smaller supply chain than most other restaurants where you're buying from a wholesaler and he might be buying from another wholesaler. And like you said, you know, it's so elongated, the process, and all those people have mouths to feed. And, you know, that's why generally the farmer gets screwed at the beginning because there's so many people after him. But for us, when I spoke to James, who was the, the farmer at the NFU, um, that was the initial kind of catalyst. I was saying, look, I want to buy your beef. This is how much we need to buy. How, how do we do this? Um, so he, he, he gave his mates a call and they set up a 
farming collective called Grassroots Farming. Um, and they are now trying to become a kind of trying to become a, you know, a big sort of name in, in regenerative space where they can define it, which we haven't even got to that yet, um, but trying to define what it means, what it means to farmers, and how can we actually get this in a meaningful supply chain? Um, because it's really hard. Like the, the abattoirs have, they hold all the cards when it comes to meat processing because it's a, it's a messy, it's expensive, it's very regulated. Um, so for us, we needed to basically start again um, we needed to buy the whole animal off the farmers because we can't just buy, you know, four quarter or whatever. It's, we need to be able to, to give that farmer peace of mind that he's getting an end customer for the whole animal, which is exactly what abattoirs do, and that's why they've become so dominant in this space. So, you know, fast forward, that's taken us three years. We're now at a stage where 30% of our beef is from regenerative farms. It's from four farms that grassroots have selected, have audited, have put regenerative plans in place specific to those farms that no regenerative plan for us is the same because no farm is the same so they all need to be incentivized um, individually um, and yeah we are where we are now and it's going really well um, but I'd be lying if I said I'm not a little bit nervous about the next 12 months um, just given inflation and, and all sorts of the kind of headwinds that are hitting restaurants but it's gone down really really well and I think customers have appreciated a business like ours trying a bit harder. So that, well, I'm interested in that as well. But but so I mean, your custom. I'm guessing your customers are all. They all. They all on the same journey as you, aren't they? I mean, do, you know, are there some people just buying lentils because, you know, they're the local lentils. Or I mean, do, I, I mean, I'm just thinking of myself. I'm I buy Hobma Dodds because, you know, I bought into, to, to 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 your vision, what I think is your vision. Yeah, I think there is a lot of that. I think there are people that just want good quality lentils, and they'll just buy good quality lentils. Um, but there are a lot of people that are buying into it because they want to support that change process. And I'm sure you'll, you'll get that as, as, you, as you, those, those products move into your restaurants. Um, I'm it, intrigued to hear that you produce your own burgers. That's fantastic. And it gives you all sorts of other opportunities, which I find very exciting, to engage very directly with consumers outside of your restaurants. Yeah. I don't know whether that's something that you're working on. But... Um, no, uh, well, in what sense? Like, well, direct to home. For, for, by oh, what yes. Yeah, yeah. We did do a bit of a, we called it honest at home during the pandemic. Mm. Um, but we're definitely looking to rekindle that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And part of, our, part of our, our kind of challenge is, you know, you buy the whole animal off a farmer, we won't put a whole animal into a burger mm, bin. No, that's, exactly. that's madness. So um, the premium bits, the, the staking cuts we sell on to a third party, um, like the Ethical Butcher, who I know you, you've sort of had yeah. some dealings with, with Glenn, and, um, and a few other businesses. And, and that is, that's kind of a way that's unlocked this whole process for us, is by buying the whole animal off a farmer means we can give them peace of mind to change how they farm. Mm. Um, but it does come with a huge amount of headache because we don't sell, we're not a wholesaler, right? we sell to customers and they give us money on their card immediately. Um, for us to become, you know, meat wholesalers has been a big one for our finance team to get their heads around. Um, and we are kind of finessing it at the moment. There's, there's probably cuts we're putting into a burger blend that are a bit wasted and they could, they, we could extract more value out of them. Um, but it means we get to work direct um, and it's kind of unlocked the whole process for us. Mm. But what, so, I mean, I, so I, you've confirmed what I think about an, a typical Hobnodos customer, but if I walk into your Spitalfields restaurant and say to, you know, a, a go to a table and say, your, your burger's not grass-fed anymore, it's regenerative. You know, what, what, what are your customers? Are they going to say, that's brilliant, that's so much better news, I'm, I'm going to pay a bit more for it? I mean, what, what, I mean, <laughs> yeah, grass-fed sounds great to me. I mean, if yeah, I'm, I know. And, and regenerative and sounds quite scary. Native breed sounds really good as well. And yeah. There's lots of, of, of nice sounding. So how are you, let's do, let's do, so, We've talked about regenerative. I don't know how many people have been here for most of the time, but I mean, is that, does everyone know what regenerative farming is? Does that, nobody? Who was that? Sorry. John. Well, John, I didn't think, I, I mean, obviously you are a god for, in, in, in my world, but I thought you were a little bit casual about it, if I may say so. I think you rather assumed that we all knew what it was, but, but have another go, John, because you are, I mean, if, if you don't, if, if, if you can't define it, then God help us. Hold on, John. Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah. 
I, no, I came up with it. It's very difficult because, I mean, we, people always ask us to define regenerative agriculture. And I, I, I've kind of gone down a vaguely scientific route of saying regenerative agriculture is any form of farming which enhances the functionality of the systems upon which the farm depends. You know, it's a bit dry. It's not very catchy, but it's, it's pretty good. You're, you're in you're in Spitalfields. Yeah. You've got a table yeah, of twenty six year olds. <laughs> yeah. And their burgers getting cold, and they want to know why they're grass fed, why the grass fed's gone. What? What? Tell me why? Why this is good for me? Why was this? You know, why? Why am I paying? And I might be paying a bit extra for it now. Well, the trouble is, I mean, the regenerative agriculture is an organic has got a, a set of principles, a set of rules. And that, that, that's kind of completely fine. There's a clipboard and you can tick off everything. Regenerative is a, is a direction of travel, as far as I'm concerned. It, and it's a movement of farmers. But the trouble is we're all moving at completely different speeds. You know? and, and so everybody's regenerative. It, we're going in that direction. But the trouble is if you're, if you're buying your burgers from a regenerative farmer, you know, every farm, well, you say everyone's got a slightly different protocol. But aren't they, I mean, regenerative agriculture surely is, I mean, the, the regenerative bit of it is we're trying to regenerate the soil, as you said yesterday, so, um, you know, so, so clearly. I mean, we're, the so, our soils are knackered, yeah. and, and they are, um, they're emitting carbon rather than sequestering it. And regenerative agriculture is, is, is a system of farming, wherever you are on it, which is about putting carbon back into the soil. And, and I, I mean, as a... As a as, you know, I'm, I'm late at it compared with you. But I just think there are, there are a few sort of simple ingredients in it, some of which people apply more. So you're very anti-disturbing um, the soil, and, and we're organic farmers, so we do disturb the soil, but we're very anti-using glyphosate. So, you know, that's all very confusing for people. But I, I, I understand it is it's having something growing on the soil the whole time, so keeping the soil covered the whole time, minimal disturbance, Lives, having livestock on it, thank it's God. It's really hard, though, because you, you say any one of those things to a 20-year-old in an Iceberg's restaurant, like, what's the problem with, with, uh, with, with disturbing soil? Like, why, yeah. why, what's cover crops? Why do we need to do these things? So we found it really difficult to, to well, that's what I was, that's articulate. Really um, yeah, and the, the, the way we launched it was with this book um, on our tables called Could Do Better. Um, and it's 32 pages. That obviously, you know, <laughs> not... That sounds like it's a proper book, but it's like it's this, it's an A6, um, and it's lots of photos and lots of diagrams, things like that. But it's a read. Like you've, you've got to be involved and you've got to get stuck into it. And you know, sometimes you just want a burger. Sometimes, I think, sometimes our customers I mean, don't care. They just want to come and have a nice meal. Um, so we're not we're not ramming it down people's throats. We're kind of doing it because we think you 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 should. Every business that's selling beef should be doing this right now. Um, I think you're motivated by internally about the change process. Yeah. You hope to bring your customers along, but you haven't got time to explain that full story. And I think it's a, it's a problem that regenerative farmers really face in that no one knows what it is, it's impossible to communicate, and there are a lot of big businesses that are gonna jump on that bandwagon and do regenerative light, and the whole thing is going to be devalued. And, and we, greenwashed as well. We right? deal with yeah. customers on the phone a lot because we do a lot of direct to home, and so we have a lot of phone calls coming in, and, farm, and customers will say to us, you know, I am interested in those lentils, whatever, and they might be, we support a lot of farmers that are on a, on a change process, on that regenerative journey, and they might not be organic, they might not have any certification, they might be very early in that story. And we'll be very open with the customer about what's happening on that farm, what, what the processes are, what's going on, and what regenerative means. And at the end of it, most, of, most often, they'll say, oh, have you got an organic version? And, and then they'll buy that. Uh, because it has, as, as you say, you know, there is that stamp. You know that set of practices. And as much as I might be able to explain the beautiful work that you know, a farmer like George Young, who's not far from here in Essex, is doing, uh, planting agroforestry and getting livestock back on the farm and uh, getting a mixed rotation going and doing all of that, that soil building and, and carbon sequestration, that is not a story most people are interested in. They want me to do the choice editing, offer them the thing, that they want to buy, and then they feel quite comfortable that Hobmadod has looked after that. And I think it's the same for you. Honest is above your name. People assume you're going to be honest and that you're going to be doing the best. That's an internal yeah. process for you to make sure that you are as honest as you can be. Yeah, 100%. And for us, it's also a good tool for recruitment as well. Like, like recruitment's in the absolute gutter right now in hospitality and trying to get young sort of Gen Zers to want to work for a beef business is not that easy. So trying to... to 
show them that actually what we're trying to do, we're not trying to just you know, offset our carbon halfway around the world and, and sort of throw money at the problem and kick the can down the road. We are genuinely rebuilding our supply chain to try and address our impact on the planet. Um, and we get to work with some amazing farmers. And one of our farmers is um, just outside of Reading, which is brilliant for us to, um, to go and visit and actually show our guys what we do. And it's right next to a massive brewery as well, which always helps. <laughs> um, so we, we have these big sessions. And it's incredible. Like a lot of our... Um, teams are, are from Europe, um, obviously less, not less now, sadly, but um, the inc incredible thing is a lot of their grandparents and great-grandparents have, have very small farm holdings, um, and they're like, yeah, this is what, this is what we've been yeah. doing for years, right? This is, this is how we've been feeding our families, and, mm. and it's only been the last 70 years that farming's been you know, intensified and mm. is so dependent on synthetic inputs, really, so... It, that in itself gives me a lot of hope that 70 years worth of damage, I'm sure we can turn it around. Can I just introduce one more complex term, as mm. we've got regenerative in there already? Can I introduce agroecological? So nice. re regenerative is something that happens on farm, and it's a set of principles and practices that you might use to restore and, and regenerate the ecosystems and, and nature recovery and support all those processes. Agroecology includes regenerative farming, but it goes beyond the farm gate, and it's about the way that we engage with the way the food is produced, how we eat it, that social change piece, equity, social justice. And well, I think what's fantastic about what you've described is that you're doing that. You are developing an agroecological food system around your your grass-rooted group of farmers and you're doing that processing work and you're taking it to your customers. And it's, I think that is the transition we need, not just something that happens on farm, but something that changes the whole system within which we buy, consume, produce food. Well, we get, we're going to have some questions. I mean, I've just got one more um, question, which I, you know, this, is, this is the question, so don't hold me account on this. Um, where does it all go? I mean, you know, somebody, maybe you said, I think, Tom, you know, that the, the classic entrepreneur is build it high and then sell it and, and, and whatever. So, you know, these, your businesses, which are doing such important things and, that, and there are others out there, you know, where, 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 how, do you, how do you get off? The, I mean, maybe you don't ever do it. What, what, what's, what's your vision for your business? I mean, not, and we haven't got very long, so. Um, but, <laughs> don't, you, you know, I mean, I'm not saying, are you going to sell it next week or whatever, but is, is that... How can you imagine, what do you imagine it being? I mean, it's, 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 it's quite relentless, isn't it? So at some yeah, point, it probably... Yeah, I mean, my job, I feel like my job, I've given honest many years. Um, I'm probably not going to be here forever doing it. Um, but I want to make our supply chain so robust and effective that it doesn't matter who we sell to, they wouldn't want to change it. Yeah. Um, which is not going to be easy, for sure. But, um, you know, that's, that's the, the goal is... That word, you know, the assumptions our customers make, some people um, probably already just, well, you know, I'd, I'd love someone to just read about honest being regenerative and just being like, yeah, cool. Mm. So they should not be kind of, you know, wildly impressed by it, just being like, yeah, they're, they're, you're a beef business, you're trying to stay with the times, like, that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we can do that. Well, and what's, what about Hobbin Dodds? Yeah, similarly. I mean, the, the great thing about the business is it allowed us, it's allowed us to do the things that we're interested in and that we think are important. And that's a really nice space to be in. Like, if you, know, if you want to address some problems in supply chain, you can do that. And you've got that autonomy to do that. Um, in terms of, we're not, we're not very saleable, I don't think, because we do do all of those complicated, slightly daft things. But we are thinking about, a, you know, strategies. We're not going to be there forever either. Strategies that might include employee ownership, for example. Um, we're, we've, we're just in the process of incorporating a community interest company to sit alongside the business. So we're sort of going back to the NGO, please, so we can, we can separate the advocacy work we're doing, which gives us some clarity in our own minds, but also allows us to have wider impact. And I think there is, there's all sorts of different ways of approaching that, that longevity of the business. We don't want it to disappear. I'm sure you feel the same. You know, you put 10 years, 12 years of, of really hard work into making something really difficult happen, and you want someone to pick that up and continue to do that difficult thing. <laughs> mm, yeah. Well, I've sold two brands I love, and I'm not sure of either of them. And initially, we took great care to make sure they were sold to the right people who, who genuinely wanted to, but you can't predict the future. I mean, we mm. sold the Cadbury's, who, who were a great company, um, and they had great aspirations, and I think they were going to make us even more fair trade. And Well, they did, and even more organic, if you could do, than, than, but then, you know a big bad American company came along and hoovered them up and 
the rest is, well, I mean, there's green and blacks are still out there, so I suppose in that sense it's great. Anyway, um, questions, questions. Uh, please, have you got any questions? Otherwise, I'll ask some more. Um, Madam, I can... Um, this is for the Honest Burger. Um, we used to have a, a suckler herd of Hereford beef um, 20 years ago. Um, and at the time, I'd just moved from Brixton. I remember looking at the Gourmet Burger Company and thinking it was built on sort of false principles. And I think the most interesting thing um, that you said is about buying the whole animal. Um, uh, because we actually eventually shut our herd down because we, Ginger Pig wanted to buy from us. Um, we had a stall at Borough Market and we found it impossible to supply beef beyond you know, those certain cuts. So for you to ensure that regenerative farming carries on in the beef sector, that is, you've hit the nail on the head. You've Thank got you. to continue yeah. your supply sector to carry on in that job. And how much of a challenge do you see that as long term? It's hard for sure, um, because you know, our, our previous burger blend is just chuck steak and rib cap that we buy off an abattoir. It's a set price, super easy. Um, generally, it's quite consistent. Um, now we're buying the whole animal. We put about 70% of the carcass into our burger blends, which is much more difficult. Um, lots more variations. And financially, every animal yields a different price. So our finance team, like, hate me <laughs> because this is, you know, our beef price just kind of goes like that throughout the week. Um, but it's the only way I feel that you can work with some great suppliers, right? And this... The, the irony is that there's some incredible beef, there's, there's regenerative beef going into abattoirs that gets absolutely no credibility, gets no premium, gets, just goes into this murky melting pot and goes off to you know, McDonald's most of the time. They're, buying, they're the biggest beef buyer um, in the country. So it's difficult, but you know, the best things always are, right? If you're trying to make change and make authentic change, for us, we knew we had to start our supply chain again and I mean the amount of people I spoke to I said this is what I want to do I want to make a burger blend out of you know basically over over half the animal and everyone's kind of looking at me going that's that's impossible like that's a waste of time like why would you do that um it's working really well you know for for a burger if you ever want to geek out on burger blends the only major um impact on flavor unless you're dry aging which is a super important thing but we we don't do that because we serve medium rare and medium but the other, the only real um, lever you can pull is, is fat. So for us, as long as we get that fat percentage right, um, we're, we're all good. We've got a very consistent product. So it's worked well with our farmers, and we had a really good um, reception at Groundswell as well, where a lot of farmers were very keen to come on board and have a chat with us about it. So, yeah, we're working well. Have you thought about bone broth business? Have, yeah. So we're, we're, um, we're chatting to a few of the bone broth businesses out there. I'm chatting to a very excited about a, probably shouldn't say, but a, a, a shoe brand you'd all be very um, familiar with um, where we're trying to use our hides to make their shoes as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think the effort that our farmers go to, and to be fair, the effort that Honest goes to as well, we want to extract as much value out of that carcass as possible so it makes more business sense because our costs are only going one way, like yours are and you know like everyone's are to be honest with you so yeah it, it would make much more business sense if we can extract a bit more value out of it let's get another so yes sorry question to tom again um two questions actually the first one one of the things i found very interesting you you, was, you said about not being able to recruit hospitality uh, into hospitality from gen z's because of the meat uh, end product. I'm quite keen to understand a bit more about what's going through that Gen Z mind that they don't want. Is, is that just simply a diet issue or is that a guilt issue? Or, uh, so that's the first question. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think it's, it's linked to what I think is the biggest problem with our food supply chain kind of debate is it's so polarised. It's you're either here or you're here and there's generally a hell of a lot of tension between these two parties. Um, and a lot of the younger um, <coughs> contingent for Honest, um, there's a, quite a few are, are plant-based, um, and they're, 
dare I say, it's almost a kind of belief system as opposed to a dietary um, requirement. Um, and, it, and it's very, you know, even to me, and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of one of the scary bosses at Honest, I can walk into a restaurant and have quite a heated debate sometimes with some Gen Zs. Um, I'm being very kind of broad stroke here, but, but sometimes <laughs> there happen to be Gen Zs. And, and it can be, you know, I can, I can almost hear the words from the multitude of Netflix documentaries that they're quoting. And it's like, that is gospel. That is absolute gospel. I've seen it. That is what's wrong with farming. Um, and what is what their solution is, is plant-based meats. Um, and they just see this kind of polarized view that all meat is bad, all plant-based is good. And, you know, you, there's, no, there's no in-between, there's no nuance to that argument. So I kind of enjoy that because I can try and add a bit of color to both sides of the argument. And yeah, lots of meat is, is incredibly bad and, and has complete disregard for, for welfare, for nutrition, for biodiversity, for everything. But there's, think, there's lots there of really a, great things as well. I mean, I think, I think there is a hard truth, though, which, where there, there is a polarised debate, and social media doesn't help. You know? So we, we work with farmers that, generally speaking, I think pretty much all the farmers we work with have livestock in their rotations, and we get phone calls from our vegan customers, and we have to explain to them what mixed farming is and, why, and what the option, what the alternative would be. Why, where would those crops be grown if they weren't grown on those mixed farms? And, of course, they'd be grown on farms that use a lot of synthetic inputs. And when we explain that, they, they get it, and they're, they're, generally speaking, really happy that we're doing that work. But at the root of it, and, uh, and the work that we did in the, in the mid-2000s, really looking at this, in which Patrick Holden was talking about his sort of recent work yesterday, is that we just need to eat an awful lot less meat because these regenerative systems, which produce fantastic quality meat in systems that are supporting biodiversity and nature recovery, actually produce very, very little meat. And we, we do need to kind of address that. And that nuanced conversation about where we buy our meat, who's produced it, and how much we can eat is a really difficult one to have. It's very difficult yeah. for you to have in your restaurant. And well, it's very difficult for us to have even here, right? And we've had an hour <laughs> to chat about it, and we've barely scratched the surface. And I think I totally get the mentality of a young social media influenced person trying to do good in the world it's been distilled down to a very simple sentence which is don't eat meat yeah and 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 that's that you know i totally get that it's a tweet it's a headline whatever it is it's just completely digestible it's very easily actionable but if you're going to swap your meat-based diet for a highly processed plant-based meat diet and think you're doing your body the, the, or the planet a favour, then I think that's when you need to really look at the nuance. Now, if you're eating from this guy's Beans. food, yeah. then, then 100%, <laughs> but you need skill, right? You need... You yeah. need I'm, I, I love food. It's hard cooking with pulses mm. and doing them, doing them well and, and adding flavours to them. And if you get it wrong, you might be like, cool, I'm never going to cook that again. Um, a, whereas soy-based chicken, you know, if, a, you're, if, you, if you eat chicken nuggets... Soy based chicken nuggets about the same. We've got Sorry. room for what? Sorry, I know you're going to have two questions, but yeah. one, one more question. Sorry, Sorry. That's the last question. Yeah. The appeal of those, those meat alternatives you know, is, is to the sort of tech disruptors in Silicon Valley that see an IP opportunity to develop a business, and they're not really interested in food or systems. Yeah. And, and arguably, or flavor. A, yeah, a, a move from feedlot, feedlot beef yeah, exactly. to monocultural soy, you know, it's, it's maybe an incremental improvement, but it's, it's not really the change we need to see happening. So, it's, it's more a point than a question. You, at the start, you wondered whether you were entrepreneurs and didn't feel like them. I think uh, the, the definition of entrepreneur is quite simple. It's somebody who is prepared to dedicate their time and risk their capital for an uncertain return in order to deliver their vision. And in that respect, I think both of you are entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurship can be pretty quiet. You don't need to be a sort of macho, chest-thumping apprentice sort of person. You're just somebody who needs to have a long-term vision, stick with it through thick and thin, and actually the journey is more important than the exit if indeed there ever is an exit. That whole process is what defines you and gives you fulfillment ultimately. Brilliant. Nice, nice place to start. Brilliant. Yeah. That's, you've done, you've given, that was my last line, but you've done it for me. I could, couldn't thank you enough. And uh, we can come and listen to you telling us about seaweed next. So <laughs> even, even pithier. Huge yourself up nicely. To follow. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you so much. Thanks.